Good afternoon. Can everyone hear me fine? Welcome to Aerocene and the Future in a Fossil-Free World. Um, I'm thrilled to be moderating and making introductions, um, guiding the conversation this evening uh, with an extraordinary group of people. Um, and we are welcoming Tomas Saraceno uh, here at MIT. The event is co-sponsored by the MIT Center for Art, Science, and Technology and the MIT Department of Architecture. My name is John Fernandez. I'm a professor in the Department of Architecture in the Building Technology Program. And I'm the director of the Environmental Solutions Initiative, MIT's uh, effort, institute-wide effort to mobilize the capacity of our researchers, our students, our community to offer solutions on climate change and other environmental uh, challenges that we face in this century. Um, the, it's, it's a wonderful group. It's a highly distinguished group. Uh, um, there's a lot of, uh, it's, it's a very multidisciplinary group. Um, and because they are so distinguished, I have long introductions for you. So bear, bear with me. It's worth going through them. And I will go through them in detail because I do think that this is the best way to set up what has really motivated this event, and that is to bring disciplines together that are quite disparate and, and often distant from one another on um, our greatest societal challenges is one of the pathways towards solving those challenges, really addressing those challenges. So beginning with Tomas Saraceno right here. Um, Tomas, uh, his work could be seen as ongoing research informed by worlds of art, architecture, natural sciences, astrophysics, and engineering, and ma material science, and other things, actually. His floating sculptures and interactive installations propose and explore new sustainable ways of inhabiting and sensing the environment. Aerocene, an open source community project for artistic and scientific exploration, initiated from Saraceno's vi vision, becomes buoyant only by, the heart, but only by the heat of the sun and infrared radiation from the surface of the earth. In 2015, Saraceno achieved the world record for the first and longest certified fully solar manned flight. During the past decade, he has initiated, initiated collaborations with renowned scientific institutions, including MIT, the Max Planck Institute, the Nanyang Technology, Technological University of Singapore, and the Natural History Museum in London. He was the first person to scan, reconstruct, and reimagine spiders woven spatial habitats and possesses the only three-dimensional spider web collection in existence. I gather you are chasing spiders this afternoon. <laughs> Saraceno lectures in institutions worldwide and directed the Institute of Architecture Related Art at Braunschweig University of Technology in Germany and has held residencies at Centre National d'Études Spatiales, MIT Center for Art, Science and Technology, and the Atelier Calder, among others. I'm gonna go through all the introductions, okay? And, and then the, the sequence will be that they will be giving 10 minute, 10 minute presentations, and then we'll have a panel discussion. Joining us is Lodovica Ilari, and the, really the host for Tomas uh, today, is a senior lecturer in the MIT Department of Earth, Atmospheric, and Planetary Sciences. She earned a PhD in Atmospheric Sciences at Imperial College London in 1982. She teaches large-scale dynamics and synoptic meteorology in MIT's undergraduate and graduate programs. She's responsible for the Synoptic Laboratory. Ilati's research interests are in synoptic meteorology, severe weather, and atmospheric blocking. She's also involved in developing innovative teaching methods that can combine fluid laboratories with synoptic data and outreach to the public and schools, therefore the connection to Aerocene. Recently, she has collaborated with MIT visiting artist Thomas Saraceno on the Aerocene project, imagining how solar infrared balloons can be used to teach about Earth climate and sample atmospheric constituents. We also have, thrilled to have Dan, welcome Dan Sitzo, also from the MIT Department of Earth, Atmospheric, and Planetary Sciences. He's professor of atmospheric chemistry since 2011, and his research focuses on the role that particulate matter plays in atmospheric chemistry, visibility, and cloud formations. Visiting his lab is quite an experience. He uh, creates um, very small atmospheres in his, in his machines, actually. Examples include understanding how aerosols nucleate water and ice clouds, improving the quantification 
of meteoritic ablation products and determining the abundance of aircraft and ro rocket exhaust. Titso's undergraduate work was in aerospace engineering, and he spent two years at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory performing spacecraft navigation before starting his graduate work. Titso received an MS and PhD in geophysical sciences from the University of Chicago for, for work with Professor John Abbott. His postdoctoral fellowship was with Dan, Dr. Daniel Murphy at NOAA Aeronomy Laboratory, and he spent three years at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology working with Professor Ulrich Lohmann. Before coming to MIT, Titzel was a research scientist at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory where he directed their atmospheric measurement laboratory. And finally, Bob Jaffe is the Jane and Otto Morningstar Professor of Physics at MIT. A theoretical physicist, his research focuses on the physics of elementary particles and quantum field theory, especially the dynamics of quark confinement and the standard model. He has served as an advisor to several national laboratories and universities, including as chair of the Science and Engineering Steering Committee of the Brookhaven National Laboratory. At MIT, Jaffe has served as chair of the faculty and director of the Center for Theoretical Physics and has received many awards for teaching and course development. From 2008 to, th to 2016, Jaffe was, the member of the, was a member of the American Physical Society's Panel on Public Affairs, which he chaired in 2015. In 2011, Jaffe led a joint American Physical Society Panel on Public Affairs and MRS study on energy critical elements, security materials for emerging technologies. And together with Professor Washington Taylor, Jaffe developed and taught a new course on the physics of energy, which was adopted as a foundational requirement for MIT's energy minor degree. The textbook, which we all waited with bated breath to, to come out and has been out since March, correct? Um, uh, is an outgrowth of the course, The Physics of Energy, um, and was published this past March. Jaffe is a fellow of the American Academy of Sci Arts and Sciences, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and the American Physical Society. So welcome to all. I'd like to have Tomas come up and give us your presentation. Thank you. Yeah, hello, hello, yes, hello. Can you hear me? Yes, wonderful. Maybe we can uh, turn a little bit down the light if it's possible. Uh, sorry? A video. Mm, a little bit. 50%, thank you. No, I'm, I'm a visual artist sometimes, and, uh, and I love that we try to focus on the images. And the other things that I promised today that I will really try to keep it with 10 minutes and maybe you kind of help me to the nine. Oh, you will go to the side here. Um, what should I say? It is a honor and I'm very, very happy to be back at MIT. Um, I feel a little bit being uh, at home sometimes and you say, oh, when will come the day that I'm again with uh, good friends? And this means I'm very, very happy um, to be here back. And, uh, and there are things like a little bit like what is happening with the project is somehow it became so much weather dependent. This mean, I think so, we have been so much talking during the last days that uh, it's cloudy, and hopefully the sun will come out to be able to perform some activities. This I mean, uh, down the road there is uh, engagement uh, psychologically that somehow I became much more uh, aware of the weather down the road. Um, now, I have a presentation. I will try to read it to try to compress it and go as fast as possible um, and try to match it in the 10 minutes. Does it mean, um, there, there we go. This is one of my favorite places on Earth, the Salar de Juni in Bolivia. When it's covered with a thin layer of water, the clouds reflect, and there are days one feels as if it were floating in the clouds. But there are days when the horizon disappears, and there is neither either above nor below. You feel immersed in something bigger, where does not the sky, where, where does the sky ends and the earth begin? And it was there that one night, in the middle of a dream, I woke up and I saw that the stars also reflected on the water. And it was not a dream. It was like I will, could walk among the stars. Every step it took, the star reverberated under my feet. And it was like feeling floating in the universe among 
the clouds of galaxies. I do not know about you, but I always dream about floating among the clouds. And today, maybe we can imagine this together. We can live in an ecosystem floating among the clouds. Cloud Cities is a long-term project of mine that where we speculate and venture of new airborne dwellings, nomadics and transnational. They are belong to everybody and does not, not depend on any type of sovereignty. In the way that we hope that Cloud City could anticipate a borderless, open source, free-flying utopia existing, existence. And um, as we said before, imagine is the force that we can lead us to create new places. This is an installation I did on the roof of the Metropolitan Museum in New York in which we speculate how this transnational space could be. The image of the Earth from space, from space does not show any border, any special constraint, but on it we build vertical and horizontal boundaries. This image, for example, shows the air space is divided into sections, allowing different typology of fossil fuel craft, aircraft to each one of them and project national boundaries into the atmosphere. It was a nightmare every time one, we launch one of these sculptures to cross the airspace. This is why I think so we could not let it fly from here because there are too many airports nearby. While enterprise to colonize other planets are put in place, this very same interface between us and the sun and the atmosphere continue to be compromised. Carbon emission fill the air, invisible radio waves develop in a hegemonic algorithm of dominance, practice ma particular matter float inside our lungs. Air has become colonized by drones, satellites, and military devices, and strictly regulated by national policies and land. How could be, how could be breathing feel in a post-fossil fuel economy? It is urgent to rethink how we can coexist with the planet and its resources, and what a stratigraphy of the future will look like. Yet what we flow today in the water are not only cloud of galaxies, but also cloud of plastic. These are the traces that we are leaving on the planet, are the marks of the era in which we, the behavior of some people is leaving a global impact on terrestrial ecosystem. This time have been named the Anthropocene. All, uh, all of these have transformed the way of human uh, sense and react to the air. To achieve long lasting change, people must relearn their relationship with the elements and understand how can we live in tandem with them rather than to control it. To be aware of the air is to sense it to one's environment. To be aware of the element which sustain you, transmit, carry. Uh, if you leave a room, uh, vacate of building, climbing a mountain, floating the sea, are you still contained within the air? The air sense the environment. But there is also any kind of um, social structure. I think so. We we'll kind of run late. We got five minutes, and does it mean we kind of uh, come up? Uh, Kind of a little bit to understand the beginning of the project, we start to collect a lot of plastic bags, we wash them, we take care, we cut them, we paste them, and we begin to draw on them. Creating gigantic canvases, we create a collection of drawing, personal stories, and friendships. Uh, and when the canvas unites, fold bends, a space is formed. Once full, is, when, once full of air, it's only a matter of time until the air inside the sculpture and the sun coming up from the horizon, that the sculpture rise up into the air, as simple as it looks. And does it mean uh, the way how it float uh, is really, really simple, as such that it's so simple that it's also that uh, no plant or animal who float in the same way as how this sculpture float. There's no plant or animal in the entire planet who float by this differential of temperature. There are many pollen, bacteria, and who are raised in the thermics, and they might get up into the air, but not by this differential temperature. It's the same, it's the Archimedes, no? When you float in the water, you put your length full of air, and then somehow you float in the water in the same way these sculptures get up into the air. And this, I mean, this way, we don't use fossil fuel like a normal balloon. You might have a burner or a candle, and then many other people are also heating the air through solar panel batteries, and then using also many times helium, which is a byproduct of many times of fossil fuel extraction. Uh, and hydrogen is quite complicated also to, to make it. 
This mean, following on that, we thought, oh, maybe we could think about a new HIPOC uh, who might get us more proactive in that extent and think about different metabolic regime of how humans also have inhabit the earth. And this might be the fourth metabolic regime to a certain extent. Uh, and this is why this is the backpack. And inside the backpack, there is this sculpture. And this is the one that we will try to tomorrow on Friday and on Saturday to get up into the air. They have different devices, which I think so is what with uh, Loro and many communities around the world we are trying to optimize and to think so of how we could uh, sense the air differently. In this case, there's a motion tracker and then make these beautiful drawings. There are different communities around the world which are really hacking, transforming, and changing. This means I'm very happy to hear um, what will be the devices we will lift up uh, tomorrow. Uh, here, there are kind of a performance that we are trying to put up together. There is. Joaquin, which is uh, coming from Argentina also, and he's working with a community. You want to tell us two words only? Two words. Yes. Yeah. Hi there, my pleasure. I'm just going to uh, show you uh, brief images of how we're building uh, a community around the Aerosin project in Argentina. This is how we uh, brainstorm. We get together for an asado and we discuss uh, or barbecue, we discussed some ideas with Tomas and a group of people in Buenos Aires back in December. And I'd like to uh, just tell you about this woman who's called Devora and wrote a book uh, called Flammable about this community living uh, near a petrochemical plant. And basically, uh, it's very near the center of the city and they have huge uh, health problems. And so we have uh, partnered uh, with uh, people to create a, a quality, an air quality monitor. And we have been talking with MIT people today so to see how we can improve this and basically get the air quality monitor airborne. And also we're thinking about ideas of uh, having an aerial mesh network that is 100% solar powered the first ever solar-powered aerial mesh network. And over to Thomas. Yes, I think so. We have one minute or zero. I can stop whatever you want. I don't have any pressure. But yeah, there is a lot of life up into the air. Uh, well, some of the sculptures, yes, have been free-flying. We launched them some, some from Berlin most of the time. We get a lot of problem with uh, getting the air regulation being able to tune with this type of sculpture. We will be next week talking with the European Minister of Transportation of trying to change the right of pass for these type of vehicles. Does it mean also we are trying to set up a different legal framework in relation with insurance and translation of papers? And, and we will try to lift up also the ministry up into the air. Does it mean some of the things that we have been doing with Lodo, and I think she will show the floating predictor, and Glenn, and Bill, and uh, Ips, uh, is this idea of really being able to circumnavigate the Earth also during the night and picking up the infrared radiation from the Earth, something which CNES, the French Space Agency, have been doing during the 70s, and somehow the program had been a little bit forgotten. And does it mean, uh, some are the, yeah, okay. These are some of the sculptures we present you at COP21, conference in Paris at the Grand Palais, which are the ones that more or less will be able to fly also during the night. and. Um, Right, the wind. I think so. A lot of this you will talk about that. This, I mean, I skipped that slides. But what we want is kind of artistic. Also, is like all this drawing, uh, feather flight, free fly, or imaginary flights. Uh, somehow, this collection somehow it will become kind of a signature toward maybe a Independence Day of fossil fuel that we are all trying to sign. This, I mean, we are collecting all these drawings, and we are lifting up. Uh, different people up into the air also. And this was a performance which was done in the white sand in New Mexico, where it was kind of the beginning of the Anthropocene with the first atomic Stop. OK, I stop. <laughs> I promise 10 minutes. Thank you.
Hi. Uh, it's, it's, it's a great pleasure to be here and also a big thanks to me to follow Thomas' step. But uh, what I'm going to do is talk a bit about the science we did in the Erosin project. And the work I'm going to describe is not only my work, it's in collaboration, very close collaboration with uh, Professor Graham Firol and uh, Bill McKenna, both in Ips. And the collaboration with Osmas started quite a few years ago, and I'm dis the mainly focusing on, ex on uh, describing some work on exploring the use of solar balloon as a platform for observing the atmosphere. Thomas has already mentioned that in his talk. On the side here, sorry, I want to go back, is the, but you've just seen the movie of one of these uh, solar balloon, and this is the one we tried to fly again this weekend. And I'll describe a little bit more what we want to do next. So uh, the, st the stages of our collaboration, I, dis I dis split it in three, uh, some historical, uh, some study of historical balloon from the, sp the French Space Agency that we presented at the, in Paris at COP21. Then uh, some work on virtual balloon flights with the float predictor that Thomas had just mentioned. And then uh, some uh, tether balloon, um, uh, 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 the explorer that we want to use for chemical uh, sampling of the atmosphere and particles in, on campus. So this is the French uh, uh, attempt, uh, not attempt, very successful use of uh, solar balloon. They're actually called Montgolfier Infrarouge. They're solar and infrared. And this is one of the balloon. It's a huge one. It's intended to reach the stratosphere. And it's filled with just air. And uh, it's got a particular configuration. If you look in here at the diagram, the top, you can see the top is a, a polyester color and covered with aluminum. So it, it can, if the sun, sun shine on it, the aluminum gets very hot eats the air inside the balloon, and it gets expanded, air expands, it becomes buoyant. But there is a particular feature that I want to point out on the bottom of the, it's transparent. If you notice here, it's actually transparent. And it's deliberately done because it wants to harness also the infrared radiation from Earth. So you know that the Earth is a body which emits in all directions infrared, and so some of this infrared radiation will be captured by the balloon. So imagine the sun goes down, the air inside gets colder, but enough infrared radiation is captured to keep it buoyant. And this is the name, Montgolfier Infrarouge. And here is data that um, we acquired through the help of Thomas from his internship at CNES, real data of one of these flights launched at, uh, in Brazil in February 2004. It reached 25 kilometers high in the stratosphere, and uh, it then got colder because the night came, came down, then up again, and then down again the following night. And then it adjusted to a kind of fluctuating day and night um, undulation from between 25 and 20 kilometers. And it flew like that uh, for 12 days. This is a 12 days uh, track, very smoothly steady on, uh, on wind from east to west. And the, just to describe the structure of the wind in the atmosphere, we made a section here. And in blue and cyan, we have wind blowing from the west. And in the pink and gold, we have wind blowing from the east. So it clearly that at this level in the stratosphere, at this particular latitude, you have a very strong flow from the east. And this is what was used to, um, to travel, to, to make the balloon travel. The idea the balloon was intended to measure chemicals, um, ozone, uh, methane, water vapor, all chemicals very sensitive to the climate of the of Earth. And uh, I just want to mention the many flights were done by the CNES, and there's a record of uh, 72 days. So they kept it up for 72 days, the record in 2001. And, and they was very successful as, as in the tropics, they had more problem in the Arctic because you can imagine that if you have clouds at low level, then they stop the infrared radiation and the balloon will come up. So very successful for the tropical exploration of the stratosphere, but not so much for the extratropic and the Arctic. So 
uh, Saracino, after his internship and he came to visit us here at MIT, re wanted to, re uh, to repro repropose this technology. And uh, uh, we made a study of the, of the data and we presented the work at COP21. And I think this was the beginning of our collaboration. And I actually was hooked on this data. It was amazing for me to discover that you could keep a balloon of that dimension for so long flying in the stratosphere. Now, uh, the second part of our collaboration is instead of involving and in say, where might this Ariocene sculpture go? I want to mention here, Thomas doesn't call them balloon anymore because they're beautiful. They're really much better than the, the other one I've just shown you. These are his sculptures presented at COP21 in Paris. And so the question that he had is uh, where this sculpture could go. Can I go up on one level, come down on the other, take the westerly, the easterly, go around in a circle? And so we developed uh, together with Professor Glenn Fearon and Bill an interactive interface to be able to check where this uh, virtual balloon could go. So I want to give you a quick demonstration of this. And uh, I'm going out now, I'm going to be kind of adventurous going out on the web. And this is something that is going to be available for you to explore after the talk and also tomorrow in lobby 10. And this plotted here is an interactive interface. You can actually move the sphere and check. This is the wind at 10 kilometer eyes, the wind speed coded in color from weak to strong is the pink is very strong. And you see the traditional, the common feature of jet in the atmosphere. We're all familiar with the jet stream covering the weather system. And it's, this is actually driven by today's data. This is the forecast data that is used for the 10-day forecast. It's actually a 16-day forecast from the National Weather Service. So I want to give you just a small uh, a kind of uh, uh, example of what I, you could do. So imagine I say I start from Boston and I, I'm now at 10 kilometer high with this wind, where should I go? So I click here and immediately you have an interactive uh, a, a trajectory is computing following the flow. So this you're following, so the flow is evolving and you're moving with the flow like the balloon of Thomas. And you can see that reach Europe and the Mediterranean has got diverted quite a bit and then it's come back in the jet, but it's not managed to go around the globe. Now the wind is very different at different level. If you scroll through, you can see the difference. Much weaker at the surface, stronger at the jet level, then strong again, but weaker higher up. And I'm choosing the 25 kilometer because it's where the mirror, the Montgolfier infrarouge was used to fly. And now I'm trying to do the same experiment that they were used to do with this wind. I'm putting a balloon here and see where it will go. And you can see they were pretty clever, the French. They knew there was this band of easterly flow and they could follow. And if I show you the, the, the change of this trajectory, I think it will going to go around all the globe in approximately 15 days. And uh, uh, the... The exploring this has been, this interface has been good, not only for exploring the wind in the atmosphere, but also teaching the main feature of the atmosphere in my classes. So it's been a great development from the point of view of our teaching. So I'm going to go back to the presentation and show you the, th the third stage, which is uh, making use instead of not free flight, but a tether balloon. You can imagine that to have a free flight you have to go through permission from the FAA, it's not easy. And so we thought, why not try to experiment with uh, a smaller balloon, which are tethered, and try to use them to uh, sample pollution in the lower troposphere. So this is our first attempt last summer in July, when it was very hot, it went up, it got buoyant very easily, it got up, it got up nearly at the top of the green building. We have to keep it down because we couldn't raise it higher than the green building. And then uh, we tried, we did another experiment in October and tomorrow and next uh, Saturday will be our third attempt with different sensor. So the science application is monitoring atmospheric chemical and particles in the lower troposphere. The collaboration this time is with Professor Jesse Kroll and the student, which is an expert in monitoring, but he mainly does it at the ground. 
is not done really vertical profile. So it's very exciting to try to test the vertical profile of this pollutant. Which variable are we interested in monitor? What can we measure and where? And here we try to summarize a little bit that there are different variables because there are different structure. If you look at NOx, which is a big pollutant, is really confined in the lower troposphere. This is also a zone product, product of a, a, a interaction with NOx, which is also very local in the lower. Carbon monoxide is also local down in the, in the troposphere. And then a lot of different particles that are, uh, they could be residual from combustion, they could be dust, and they can spread as high as 10 kilometers or even more, and Dan will talk about those with an expert. Ozone tend to be concentrated higher up, and this is where those stratospheric flights we're trying to measure. The maximum ozone production is actually around 20 kilometers. And the usual the thermodynamic variable that I'm interested in as a meteorologist, temperature, humidity, will also be a target. How can we measure them? So we want to create a kind of community of users all over the world to measure this quantity and uh, with the balloons, but what type? We can use the mere balloon higher up, as just shown to you, imagine it hovering up and down for 72 days or even longer if you can and taking measurement of ozone, methane, very important for the um, greenhouse effect. And lower here, it's much easier, and we can even do it on campus with students and measure the pollution with this tether balloon. So we're going to try to do this uh, tomorrow if the sun comes out. If it doesn't, tomorrow we have uh, forecast is telling us uh, not mostly, I wrote this presentation yesterday, it's actually sunny without the mostly now. So I'm very confident Saturday will be a good day. So take your time, come out, and come to watch us. Now, finally, just the last things is, uh, this is, is uh, inspiring us for an educational activity, educational, um, uh, that which is ongoing, which we call it S-Globe, Environmental Science Globe. It's a project funded, funded by the ESI, and the idea is that we have an interactive way of displaying data, very similar to what I've shown you for the area scene, but uh, you can be any data and you can manipulate it, plot it in the sphere and use it. So I just finish and say, come to join us and explore this in the lobby. Here I am with Tomas at Davos and a lot of the, vis the visitors, participants of Davos were very intrigued and tried to guess where they could fly in the world. Thank you very much. So I wanted to start out by saying thank you to Lodo. Uh, it was a real pleasure getting the invitation to come and speak to you all tonight. Uh, growing up, one of my uh, heroes uh, in science was Richard Feynman, who was a, a fantastic physicist, but was always very passionate about talking uh, about how he spent time with artists, because there were these two different parts of your brain that needed to be exercised. Um, and so he would sort of talk physics with these folks and, and listen to their work in art and felt that it made him a better scientist as a result. And I've, I've really felt that way about uh, talking about this project and dealing with this project and was very, very interested to participate. So one of the things that we were asked to do this evening was tell you a little bit of our, about our research and how it uh, was related to the Aerocene project. And so I work in the area of climate change, as John mentioned, to, to start out. And so um, I'm not only a, a scientist, but I'm also an avid historian. And so I, I love the history behind the science that we do. Um, and so I'm starting out here with one of my favorite quotes, which is by George Santayana. Um, those who that cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And I think that this is especially true of, of climate. 
And so uh, what I thought I'd start out by doing tonight is, is telling you a little bit about the climate of our planet, the work that we're doing in it, and then get back to how I think we can do it better with the type of technology, um, which also happens to be the art that you're hearing about this weekend. So this is the temperature history of the Earth in the past, and this goes back almost a million years in, in time. And one of the things that you can see about it is that the Earth has been warmer for periods of time, and it's been colder for periods of time. And over the course of this time, uh, you can see that in blue here, these are ice ages when the, the Earth has been much colder. There's also uh, these peaks in temperature when the Earth has been warmer. Uh, we should actually be rather thankful that currently we're living in what we call an interstitial period. And the average temperature of our planet right now is about 57 degrees, which uh, if we had the average temperature in Boston uh, the last few weeks, I think we'd all be quite happy. Um, but over the course of the year, over the whole of the planet that you just saw in those beautiful images, uh, it works out that we're at about 57 degrees. And so one of the things that you can ask about, because we, we were talking about this idea of an Anthropocene, the, the time period that we as humans have affected, but the climate of our, our planet really changes quite a bit over time. And you can wonder you know, how much of this is, is natural. And it turns out that uh, over history, over almost 100 years ago now, people had worked out that the temperature of our planet is very variable, that you have to go through these ice ages and these interstitial periods, and it has nothing to do with us as humans being on the surface of the planet. Of course, we weren't there for most of the time in that figure that I just showed you. And a very, very smart scientist by the name of Milankovic figured this out and, and realized that this had to do with the orbital mechanics of, of our planet how our planet is, is tilting on its axis when it's slightly further, slightly closer to the sun. But if you zoom in on that temperature record, you start to realize uh, that the temperature of our planet has changed a great deal over just the last few generations. And this is highlighted in blue on the figure that you can see here. So instead of these big swings in temperature that took tens of thousands of years, over just the last 100 years or so, the planet has gotten a great deal warmer. The blue actually on here is the instrumental record. It's the period of time for which we've had accurate thermometers to make measurements of, of climate. And that should give us some sense of, of how recently we've only begun to understand the planet that we live on. It's only just over about 100 years that we've been able to tell about the climate of our planet and really understand it. By the way, that longest record of temperature that we have for the United States was actually made just south of us. It was uh, made in the Blue Hills, um, starting in about the 1880s. What you'll realize, as opposed to looking at the last plot that I showed you, where temperature swung wildly over these tens of thousands of years, this is about the length of human history. Human history goes back, of, of course, a, a few thousand years further than this recorded history. But you know, this is going back into the ages of the Roman Empire. And what you'll notice instead of these wild swings of many degrees of, of temperature, instead, everything on this plot is within about a half of degree. So that 57 degrees that I said for the global average hasn't changed more than about a half a degree in that period of time. And so one of the points that, that we have to understand when we start talking about the Anthropocene, the effect that we've had on the planet around us, is that we've, been, we've grown as a civilization in a very stable climate, perhaps the most stable climate that this planet has seen in over a million years. And so this is no coincidence that this has happened. We've really benefited from this and this ability to evolve in a world that's very stable. But we're starting to move outside of that. And so I, I mentioned that I was a, a history buff. And so one of my personal interests is understanding how it is that we've been able to understand how we're affecting the climate of our planet. And so uh, this is uh, one of my favorite scientists. This is John Tyndall, who is a, a Brit. And he was very interested in uh, building different instruments, just like we do in our lab, the one that John mentioned a few moments ago, um, to understand how the temperature of the planet is what it is. And so this is something that he called a comparative spectrometer. And he was able to fill this tube with different gases and try to understand how they interacted with solar radiation and infrared radiation, those two things that are powering the aerosene balloons that you're going to be seeing more about uh, in the next few days. And so what Tyndall realized was that most of our atmosphere, most of what we breathe is nitrogen and oxygen, and it has no effect on the, the temperature of our planet. But there's a few key elements out there, carbon dioxide being one of them, which is a so-called greenhouse gas. 
It absorbs that infrared energy, the same thing that powers these balloons, this uh, MRI that you were hearing about it at night. And it allows that energy to be trapped, much like a blanket around the planet. And it raises the temperature of a, the planet as a result. And so now mind you, from the dates that you're seeing on there, Tyndall was doing his work in, in the mid to late 1800s, and he had already really figured out the basics of the climate of our planet at that time. So if you ever hear that climate change is, is something that we're just figuring out right now, I'll talk about that in a few moments, but really the basics of this were all worked out in the mid 1800s. Um, and Tyndall's famous for writing a paper about how if we didn't have these wonderful greenhouse gases around our planet, we'd be caught in an icy grip. And so, that takes us to the next part of our story, uh, who was a, a scientist that followed on Tyndall's work. This was Svant Arrhenius, and he was working at the end of the 1800s and the, build, the beginning of the 1900s. And he was really intrigued by this idea that there were these materials in our atmosphere that could make it warmer or colder. And so what Arrhenius did was figured out how much warmer the planet would be as a result of having different amounts of these greenhouse gases. And so he looked at doubling amount of CO2, for example, and seeing how much warmer the planet would get. And he wasn't interested in doing this for altruistic purposes. You might think that he was worried about greenhouse gases and global warming, the things that we're talking about, for example, at the COP21 conference. Um, Arrhenius was actually from Scandinavia, and he was interested in trying to make the planet warmer. The winters were too long for him, much like us in Boston this year. And so he was very interested in doing things like lighting coal on fire to try to make the planet warmer as a result. So not quite thinking about things the same way we do now. So what have we done? What is this Anthropocene that we've been talking about? Well, largely it's this input, this burning of fossil fuels and the input of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases to our atmosphere. And one of the results that this has had is to warm the temperature of the planet. So we're now warmer than we probably have been in, in the last several thousand years at least, perhaps many tens of thousands of years. And so over that instrumental record that I just told you about, the warmest years on record from 1 to 20 are on the upper right here. Um, I haven't updated this recently. Uh, 2017 just came in about a month ago at number two on this plot. And so I often think about this because when we tell people that the climate that children will grow up in is different than the climate that we grew up in, the climate that we're experiencing now is already different than it was when we were growing up. None of the first years of my life are actually on the top 20 years on this plot. They all fall below that. The climate of the last few decades has been radically different. This Anthropocene has led to a radically different world already now that we're living in than we experienced even a generation ago. So one of the things that, that we do a, a great deal of is trying to understand exactly what the climate of our planet is. And unfortunately, even thanks to the work of Tyndall and Arrhenius back at the late 1800s, early 1900s, they missed a few things in their calculations. They weren't able to get the climate of the planet quite right. And one of the reasons is that um, this is actually a, a beautiful image of the planet, um, something that I had on my wall as a child from the Japanese Space Agency. But I think we already know, and, and Tomas showed an earlier picture of this. What is this missing? Clouds. Clouds. The planet at any one time should actually look like this, not the other picture. And until we understand the particulate matter in our atmosphere, we can't understand the climate. So particles scatter some of that incoming solar radiation, just like the gases, the greenhouse gases are trapping some of those outgoing terrestrial radiation, the infrared radiation that was spoken about before. Beyond that, we've even changed the properties of the clouds in our atmosphere. There's more clouds now than there were earlier before this Anthrop Anthropocene onset. And so understanding all of these things is something that we critically need to do. So with my last few seconds, what I want to do is try to bring this back full circle to one of the reasons that I'm so excited about this project, which is making these measurements in our atmosphere is extremely costly. You can think about having to go out and, and do research or, or get a research aircraft and fly it at the cost of many tens of thousands of dollars. The idea of having these incredible small platforms, things that can be sort of crowdsourced to do measurements on a very local scale, but, many, but maybe in many places at the same time, can really add to the knowledge that we currently have about our planet, really help us reduce that uncertainty in, in how climate is going to be changing into the future. So with that, I'll say thank you. Um, I really appreciate the chance to come out, and I'm looking forward to the panel after this.
Well, thank you to Lodo and uh, the rest of the organizers for the opportunity to talk here. Um, I first met Thomas, must be over five years ago, when he was artist in residence here. Uh, and I was fascinated immediately by the imagination and creativity of his sculptures and also by his dedication to the problems faced by the culture and, and by our environment. Um, I did struggle to figure out exactly what I was invited to talk about since I don't work on the, either the air scene or directly on the atmosphere. But I have spent the past 10 years uh, studying, teaching, and now writing about the uses, sources, and systems that involve energy. Um, so I thought I would uh, take some of the lessons from what I've learned and taught and just provide some kind of basic picture about a couple of issues that follow from the physics of energy. Um, the two topics I'm gonna to talk about, and I'm gonna be very brief and very uh, not technical, I hope, are uh, the scale of the problem we face in trying to convert our culture to sustainable energy sources. And secondly, uh, a couple of lessons from the second law of thermodynamics. So first, let me talk about scale. Um, the uh, tagline to talk about the scale of the problem we face is the number 20 terawatts. Um, this is the number, and it's uh, useful to spell it out in digits. This is the number uh, that measures the rate at which humanity uses primary energy. 20 times 10 to the 12th joules per second of primary energy. 90% um, of this energy comes from burning carbon and its associated compounds. About a quarter of it from gasoline, from petroleum, about a quarter of it from coal, about a quarter of it from natural gas, 10% from uh, biomass and waste, and only about 6% from renewables and almost all, uh, from renewable hydropower. Uh, and hydropower has already been developed to the extent it can be developed. That leaves about 2% left for the modern renewables of wind and solar energy. Um, I think 20 terawatts is a hard number to comprehend, so I want to try to translate it into some pictures and some images that will make it more persuasive to you. Um, this is a coal train winding its way through the mountains of the American West. Um, and 20 terawatts is the energy equivalent of 2 million tons of coal per hour fueling our modern economy. I could have shown some pictures of the skyline of Singapore or the docks of Long Beach to try to show you the scope of the enterprise that this fuels. But you have to appreciate that this is an amazing scope. Now, we don't burn 20 million tons of coal. I've reduced the oil and the natural gas and the biomass to the equivalent amount of coal to just give you a picture of the effort that's involved. Um, to make this more concrete, a typical uh, coal train has about 120 cars. It's got about 120 tons of coal per car. That's 15,000 tons per train and we need about 130 fully loaded trains of that nature to supply the energy that our civilization thrives on and is using in greater amount all the time. Um, I'm not gonna let go of this easily. Let me uh, uh, try to say it another way. Um, this is a large coal-fired power plant in England. Um, it uses about three gigawatts worth of power uh, constantly to produce about one gigawatt of electricity. Um, in order to find an equivalent to the carbon dioxide that we pump into the atmosphere, it would be equivalent to 3,200 of these large coal-fired power plants operating continuously uh, 24 hours a day all year long. That's the rate at which we're putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Um, I'd rather think about renewables, so let me try to convert this number into something that relates to renewable energy. Uh, these are solar panels. They're the uh, highest efficiency way we have of gathering solar energy in a very uh, high quality form. And uh, to supply the, our civilization with the energy that we require, it would require a million square kilometers of silicon photovoltaics at their current efficiency. Uh, spread out over the tropical deserts. And the tropical deserts are chosen just because they're the sunniest, cloud-free areas 
uh, where you could place solar panels and get the most sunshine. Um, the lesson I want to take from this is that transforming society to sustainable energy is heavy lifting. Um, this is a huge problem. It's not going to be solved uh, unless we marshal the resources of our culture and convince uh, leaders, political leaders and economists that uh, changes in behavior and changes in investment have to be made over a very short time span in order to bring a sustainable energy revolution. Um, the second thing I want to talk about is the second law of thermodynamics. Um, and it's hard to talk uh, to non-technical audiences about the second law of thermodynamics, so I want to try to say it in non-technical form. The simplest non-technical form is that there is no free lunch. Um, another way of saying it is that disorder in the universe can only increase with time. But the implication I want to talk about today uh, is uh, that some forms of energy are more useful than others. Um, the most useful forms of energy are those that have what we call zero entropy or very negligible entropy, negligible disorder. And uh, the two striking examples are mechanical energy and electromagnetic energy. Uh, they can be translated directly into useful work for humanity's needs. Um, thermal energy, heat, uh, is a varying quality depending upon its temperature. And uh, sunlight is probably the highest quality form of heat energy that's available to us. It comes from the sun with a temperature of 6,000 degrees Kelvin, which is about 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. It's really hot. And that means it's very high quality. In particular, the second law of thermodynamics limits the efficiency at which you can convert sunlight to the most usable form of energy, electricity. And that limit is 95%. That's really wonderful. It means that sunlight is a tremendous resource. It can be converted directly into useful work at a 95% level. Well, we use solar panels to collect light and turn it directly into usable electricity. And uh, there's been research on solar panels for generations now. They're becoming cost effective and competitive with fossil fuels. They're being mounted on in large uh, solar farms across our country and, in, and elsewhere in the world. And their net efficiency, the rate at which they turn solar energy into electricity, is 6 to 7%. So we started with a uh, uh, resource which is 95% potential useful energy, and what we can get out of it with the best of our efficient solar panels on a per square meter basis is between 6 and 7%. So let me contrast that with warmth. Um, and the example I want to use is um, ocean thermal energy. Now, people have known for years that the surface of tropical oceans is warm compared to the abyssal depths. In fact, the surface of tropical oceans averages about 27 degrees centigrade, and the depths are just a few degrees above freezing, 5 degrees centigrade. And there's a picture here uh, showing a, a slice through some tropical uh, ocean where you can see the very hot water on the top, and the depth, the depth with uh, the purple and magenta color indicates very cold water. And you can build an engine, just like you can build an engine that works on coal. You can build an engine that takes that heat from the surface waters, runs an engine, and dumps the extra entropy that must be created, the extra disorder, into the cold water at the depths. The same laws of thermodynamics that allow solar energy to be at most theoretically 95% efficient allow ocean thermal energy to be 7% efficient. That's the best you could do if you satisfied all the conditions of uh, efficiency that are available. So what's the situation? Well, there are devices that have been proposed, and a couple have been set up experimentally. That This is a kind of cross-section to such a device that takes warm water at the surface, runs an engine, and dumps cold water at depth. And nobody's achieved anything that can be measured as an efficiency so far. So if 95 ramps down to 7 by the time we're finished with our crude ways of getting power, where is 7% going to take us? 
So I want to start, I want to end on an optimistic note. This is my last slide. I want to just emphasize the promise of solar energy. Um, this is a resource that streams to Earth at about 20,000 times the rate at which human beings use energy. It's high quality. It can be harvested efficiently. We don't know how to do that yet. We don't know how to store it effectively, and we don't know how to transmit it as effectively as we should. But the resource is immense, um, and the conversion to electrical energy at high efficiency is possible, and at moderate efficiency is really within grasp, and it offers the promise for a renewable energy future. Thank you. So um, I'd like to invite the panel up to um, for discussion. Um, so what we're going to do, we have half an hour, right? OK. So what we're going to do is um, I'm, we, we would love your questions, your comments, your thoughts. We're, the, a room like this is kind of funny because we're here in the front, you're back there. Really should be in the round. We should be all sitting around because we're in one room. We should all have a discussion, actually. I'm going to start it off, though, as you're thinking about your questions and your comments. And when you do have a question, please come up to the mics. Tell us your name and, and ask your question. Um, so I'm going to start off with Tomas, appropriately. Um, so Bob's um, thoughts about a transition to a low carbon world and the numbers behind that um, are illuminating and the, I, 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 I always think of Bob as the, the keeper of the laws of nature, right? That's, that's <laughs> I wish. And, and um, I'd actually really like to hear more, uh, Tomas, about the bridge to a uh, fossil-free future, that you use that tagline. And actually, maybe Joaquin, uh, the, the work that you showed was really compelling because there's a pathway that involves citizen science, and community engagement, which is something completely different than necessarily the technological and the science pathway. Could you talk a little bit more? And Joaquin, if you want to say a few words as well. So, um, yeah, I've been. Uh, it's, it's it's working. No, um, no, I'm I'm interested more also of uh, how Bob. You could uh, maybe then relate this kind of thermodynamic imagination that we are trying to pursue in kind of this uh, elemental way of. You know, because there is always this coupling of metabolic regimes of how we have been living on planet Earth and how, in different times, uh, humans have kind of evolved in relationship with how they're grasping the resources, no? The first kind of metabolic regime, we were hunter and gatherers, nomads, tribes around the world. We will always follow the season and follow the sun, right? Then we invented agriculture, agriculture, we became sedentary. The second metal over, we domesticate the sun, domesticate the animals, and somehow we managed to become sedentary in a certain area. Then the third metabolic regime, we kind of learn how to extract more from the sun and you know, we learn how to burn charcoal, which somehow a rock, you know, how many millions of years have of sun influence it needed to then be able to burn. Does it mean we start to have all these extractive economies, which somehow also, you know, expanded the civilization to become again, uh, um, you know, this kind of, um, you know, I think so how much population now is living on the cities. Does it mean the fourth metabolic regime that somehow we are proposing is like, a, what happened when? you know, these extractive economies and all these resources and also the way of, because every metabolic regime somehow also have allowed different modes of aggregation of people. You know, when we were nomads, the tribes cannot grow to a certain extent, then the other one keep growing, keep growing. This means the relationship we always have established of how we have related our society with the sun through this metabolic regime. We also gave products of, you know, transportation, mobility, and so forth. This means now, it's a rather a speculation things, but thinking, you know, because what it does is it cross this kind of um, idea of very elemental, no? You, the sun is heated up. You don't need a solar panel, a battery, or convert it to electricity. Directly, you get to maybe something I like to speculate from after Homo sapiens, maybe we became Homo flotantes, and we became nomads at the beginning of the atmosphere. And you might think, oh, we were fishes floating in the water while we moved to the land, and why we might be the benefit to move into the air. This means I leave it there. But you know, really try to maybe get it around there. Any, anyone else want to say? 
Well, maybe I just yeah. would add one thing that I, I think that a transformation of society's way of thinking about its culture and energy is a really important part of dealing with the energy transfer, the transformation to renewable energy. We demand uh, that we can turn on our washing machine at any time of day. Yeah. We expect to be able to take a car wherever we want to go. And, uh, you know, the, the variability of energy sources that you have to deal with, for example, with solar energy and versus infrared energy, if human beings adapted to the cadences at which energy is available, it would make a big impact on what we have to do in order to reach a sustainable future. So please, uh, please come up to the mics. I'm, I actually want to um, follow up with Lucky. I'm going to ask you to say some words because um, I'm very curious. Is, is, I'm very curious about um, a particular thing. So the the outcomes that you are after when engaging the community, especially a community that is under pressure from environmental conditions, right? Okay. Right. What 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 do you what what happens? What uh, what are the actions that the community takes? All right. Um, to begin with, um, I'm going to be honest. Uh, sometimes I uh, feel a little pessimistic about uh, weather and climate change. Um, I have a few friends in Harvard who are architects and are actually here. And yesterday we were talking about um, what we called the brace for impact scenario. You know, and I was uh, asking them, when is that coming? And we realized that we are already living the brace for impact scenario uh, because of the, you know, um, <clears throat> amount of times we are seeing all these uh, extreme weather events. And so in terms of uh, community, I think uh, this is going to change us a lot. You know, we are going to have to find new ways to relate to each other, new ways to help each other, new ways to learn uh, from each other. And this is um, why I envisage this um, future of uh, technological developments that might seem basic but might actually be very helpful, like this idea of creating a solar... Um, aerial mesh network, and I imagined uh, places where there have been floods in the past years, and uh, how uh, do you deploy a relief effort team to a place that has suffered a natural disaster, and um, this is where I think of this, you know, uh, network that runs uh, on clean uh, solar energy. Uh, but um, just to sum it up, um, I very much agree with uh, Bob uh, of the sheer size of the problem. And actually, um, each of us has a role in this, you know, and maybe uh, we can start thinking how to live a more energy efficient life. So, thanks. Thank you. Questions? No one's stepping up. Yeah, Caroline? So this may be a challenge for my dear friend Tomas, but I would be interested in the others. The human architectural fascination with life in a capsule, so the sky city, the cloud city, the Bucky Fuller spaceship city, these are in fact incredibly energy intensive, right? They are the sort of emotional manifestation of freedom that is the result of intensively, you know, energy intensive manufacturing processes, um, you know, delivery systems, uh, infrastructures of power that are somehow, you know, brought up there as batteries or whatever. So in a way it's a challenge to the nomadic fantasy and how this is coupled with the very elaborated technologies that would make such a cloud city possible. Is that, okay, it's a tough question. No, but it's no, it's I, like I, tough love, <laughs> tough love. No, I think so, you know, uh, um, I think so. You know, it's so simple as you can start to reuse plastic bag and instead of downgrading material, you 
upscale in relationship of the relation you have with plastic bags. I'm very happy that now, you know, uh, plastic bags through Museo Solar into the community suddenly can give another lifespan or the lifespan will correspond with the ability of themselves to be within the uh, environment we have created. Okay, now let's, let's put it that way. This, oh, Juan Enriquez is there. <laughs> this, I mean, uh, now, uh, first, uh, you know, it's like, a, I don't know, I will always say it's like, a, you know, the idea of, uh, you know, in Bruno Latour, we are condemned to live in the sublunar, right? Sublunar. Mm -hmm. That we somehow, you know, the bubble is somehow planet Earth today. And we have kind of an environmental justice responsibility also of the amount of people who are on board on this spaceship Earth. And Bruno doesn't like it, the analogy. But somehow, you know, I think so. When you understand also the constraint of where we are living, you are living in a bubble to a certain extent, right? And there are some resources that somehow maybe you can start to relate differently. And there is this kind of logic on that. I mean, the other is also like when you think in the way that I propose also, I think so, it's like a... And I think so what the aerosine does is also how to fly with the feet on the ground. Does it mean there is a huge responsibility that I think so when you scale it too fast, too quickly, then you end up in a modernist dream. But while the way of how we are doing the things today here with Joaquin, with Lodo, with the measurement, the quality of the air, well, let's give it a little bit more time. You know, Fuller also said like there is no lack of energy, there is no energy crisis. There is a crisis of imagination and how we can couple and recouple ourselves with the environment. I mean, I think so, the relationship of trying to say is like, oh, how complex is, you know, when I was at NASA in 2009, people have put, put people in the moon, and I said, for 300 euro, you collect a couple of plastic bags, and you can lift up yourself from the ground, they cannot believe it. This, I mean, there is somehow such an addiction of people of thinking the infrastructure that you need to do such a thing that is unbelievable for them to get out of this. And this means, you know, any time that you demonstrate this, people say, oh, you know, there's some kind of magic. Now, I challenge yourself and, you know, let's put it that way, you know, and you know that it's, it's quite cheap. We are really working now seriously on something which is a 300-meter sphere diameter, which could be also like a, uh, which can be able to lift up a couple of hundred people up into the earth, a rigid sphere, and it's incredible cheap, if I tell you. And the infrastructure is something that even an artist can understand and reteach to a whole community of scientists or re-engage on to understanding how we can sense the sun differently or how, you know, I mean, just only, I mean, since with Loro we know, but, you know, I've been with director of NASA and people like this, I say, oh, what is the average on a jet stream? They don't know it. You know, how long it will take you to make around the world, actually, you know, the only what you know is like, okay, in a current plane, you got to your destination half an hour early if the wind was blowing, but now if you are drifting, no? If you are in a kind of a drift, a kind of drift situation, you know, it's like it, it takes quite an effort. And I think so it's not right, I think so, to all the time, you know, condemn some idea of, of thinking that infrastructure is so gigantic. Well, actually, it's very simple. It's simple as a plastic bag in the hands of somebody else. Mm -hmm. yeah. Please. Uh -huh. So my question is regarding the solar balloons that you guys talked about. So assuming that you will be able to launch these balloons at the location that you like to, what is the um, vision, what is the plan if you collect all these data all across the planet, then where does that data go and what, you are, what are you expecting to get out of it? What is the you know, uh, plan for it if panel could speak to it a little bit? The second question is for the efficiency of the solar uh, power. Uh, so I want to find out what is the bottleneck not to have higher efficiency. And uh, so what, what is the um, efficiency that we are aiming for to replace that 130 coal trains per hour? So can you give a sense what we are looking at it there? I can start with the collection of the data. Uh, as I mentioned before, there are different types of data you can collect. If you go higher up in the stratosphere, normally you would be monitoring the ozone. You know the ozone layer is very important for uh, life on Earth. And if you have depletion of ozone, uh, you, uh, you, you, uh, the, you can get the, ultra, uh, the value of light which comes to Earth and be very damaging. 
So this is why it's a monitoring to make sure that we, we had an example of an ozone lull not long ago, we're just recovering out of that. So it's a kind of monitoring to make sure, but there are other, other gases like Dan has been mentioning about, like CO2, methane, which are very important for the, as a greenhouse. So the increase of those glasses makes uh, the temperature on Earth increases enormously. And so we want to monitor to make sure that those are not increasing too much and what is the trend that we notice. So those are the upper level. At low level with a tether balloon, you can actually monitor the air quality. So all these particles I was talking about and chemical are very uh, damaging to your health. So they're the result mainly of combustion. They can produce acid rain. And there are also particles with self or dimension that they can be very, very bad for your health. So the quality of the air locally is very important for when you live. And it is monitored, you know, you got, you know, in the summertime, you have a lot of um, sometimes uh, pollutant trapped in the lower troposphere and it can be very, I come from a region of Milan where uh, you have a very poor air quality. We have heard about Beijing and all these big city. So they can be very efficient in, in measuring the, how, what is the chemistry of those, uh, of those lower tropospheric layer, what's going on there, and how we can control the pollution. So there are different type of monitoring that you can do. To follow up on what Lodo just said, uh, another thing that, that we've really struggled with as scientists over the last couple decades is, is shrinking budgets. And there's really only a handful of research aircraft that we can do these high quality measurements with, especially uh, talking about things like the ozone layer. We're still relying on Cold War era aircraft, uh, ER2s, the old U-2 spy planes that have been retasked, um, things like that. They cost many tens of thousands of dollars per hour. Um, they're absolutely necessary to validate new satellites that go up to understand the quality of, of the ozone, to make sure that the ozone hole is indeed still closing, something that we are just getting out of. And so the idea that, that we might have these platforms that could allow this, us to do this at much lower cost um, in many more locations uh, is, is really in, intriguing. Um, and, and the surface measurements as well. Um, we're notoriously uh, bad about making most of our measurements in the Northern Hemisphere, where most of the developed countries are, and notoriously bad about making too few measurements in the Southern Hemisphere. And this idea of, of low-cost platforms, that we could look at these types of problems, understand air quality, for example, in some of the large cities in the Southern Hemisphere is, is something that we critically need to do as scientists. I could add that, if, for example, your keen example, and he's talking about community in, in, uh, in outside Buenos Aires, which are uh, very badly affected by pollution. You can see them. Uh, we had an example like that in Venice. Venice is a beautiful city. When I was growing up, you will approach yes. Venice and you will have a, a huge uh, chem out chemical plant there and it was terrible quality. So they probably are in the same situation, but you can prove that by, with rules and regulations and your health is badly affected by the pollution. So the idea just to pull that to the government so that they can do something about it. No, well, you, do, you, do it, you do it by yourself. You could have you people collecting data. We collect it. We will do the experiment on Saturday. We can collect data. You can have community. Joaquin is trying to make a community responsible for trying to collect some more information. And then the data itself will Will, uh, if you can show that it's so bad, you can force some political action. Yeah, there is a, a group we work with called, well, besides being with Pablo Sarer, part of Red Cross also, which they kind of engage also within the project, there is a group which is called Public Lab. They do a lot of environmental justice. Mm -hmm. And as you mean, in the hands of them, they provide a lot of downgrading mm -hmm. or kind of low scale monitoring devices, which we hope so, you know, within working together with. Uh, high scientists with low communities also coming up together with, uh, and they're, they're building huge cases also to big multinational also, you know, in the case of Shell, which is co coming up in the Vision Inflammable where Joaquin is talking, you can build up huge cases on trying to measure and giving the hands of them the way of how they monitor the environment. I think I owe you an answer to the second part of your question. Um, really, there are two things to say. The first is that, um, 7% as a final uh, efficiency for solar energy is not as bad as it may sound. It's more that um, it's a bad starting place for ocean thermal energy. 
but um, a million, uh, I was writing an article about this and I said a million square kilometers is half the surface area of Libya. And the person I was writing it for said, people don't know how big Libya is, so maybe you should convert <laughs> it to Texas plus Oklahoma. <laughs> um, so then uh, it becomes this problem of storage and transmission. People are very refractory about having transmission lines strung across their landscape. But electric, high voltage DC electric transmission is very efficient and could carry electricity from faraway places to where it's needed. Um, the second is, you, where, where, how did 95% get down to 7%? Um, some people in the audience may, may be perplexed because you can read that the efficiency of, of uh, PV modules now is about 20%. But um, when you lay them out on the landscape, they have to be tilted at an angle and they block each other. There have to be pathways between them so that people can walk and clean them up when they get dirty. There's piping and, and support structures. There are inverters that change it from DC to AC. And that knocks it down by a factor of about two and a half from 20% to seven and a half percent. In principle, silicon can get to th about 30% efficiency consistent with the laws of thermodynamics. Great. Mary? Um, responding uh, to the visionary nature of the project and some of the um, earlier uh, works such as City Skies, um, I'm curious if the panel could comment on whether or not they think that it's possible to even imagine physically a floating city um, I've been very inspired by and interested in Buckminster Fuller's Cloud Nine project, which is maybe some, which is a related project, um, a city with a mild wide diameter um, that floats in the sky. And he makes a very persuasive argument to a lay person, but I'm curious to know if the panel has any thoughts about whether or not this could be possible. Uh, I think so. I mean, the, the problem is like, you know, sometimes you, um, <coughs> What, with something which is very beautiful, you know, it's like a, a, what I think so is a, if you really take the challenge yourself and you really try to build it and to build it with an infrastructure which is different than the infrastructure that usually things are built and with a certain uh, responsibility distributed agency of how we try to the project grow bit by bit. Sometimes I'm very anxious. And it's been, it will be very different color, a very different understanding of what it might be, these cloud cities and which type of political uh, challenge we might be facing with them. Now, something very simple, when we float and we make a worldwide record to lift up a person in the air with a certified vehicle in the white sand, uh, when we were trying to repeat the same in a surface which is not white, we were not lifting even one person. Does it mean your power of being, how much people you can carry up into the air is really dependent about the surface, the albedo, the reflectivity of the earth. And I mean, this could be the clouds or could be the surface of the air. You can also see and think about a sea when it's very calm and you don't have someone ripple in the water. This I mean, this balloon is kind of an amazing thermometer. It's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing sensor. It will go up and down and really weave something, which are because, you know, there is human still, we are so civil, there are it's like, oh, you cannot look at the cosmos, you cannot look at the, you know, out of the scale is the problems are all on Earth. But there are few people who really understand this choreography, this relationship that between the earth and the sun, this idea to what Lola was doing, you know, this drawing going up and going down, and being able to understand these boundary layers where we live. And there are people sometimes are very, oh, oh escapism, or you get that or you are getting here. You cannot be in between. And it's been, you know, it's like every time that you try to, and this means this tomorrow, it's like we became so much weather dependent. This means tomorrow or maybe not. Tomorrow, maybe not. And day after tomorrow, no. And remember, all the psychology of people is like a, a turnkey solution. It's a cut down. Well, here, is, the cut down is much more gentle. Do you see the sun coming from the horizon? You kind of float. Gravity seems to reverse itself. Space is stopped to be a, you know, the Karadam line is 300 kilometers high where objects start to fall. Well, we fall upward. We reverse ourselves, this means, you know, stillness in motion. You move with the wind, you became the wind. There are a lot of, I mean, if you take it seriously, you start to do, I think so, in the moment that the cloud city might be up there, I think so we might have solved already down here on planet Earth. Maybe we have been learned how to live on that bubble called Earth today. And maybe we might get ready to get another step 
towards somewhere else, right? The solar sails and whatever it might be there. But is, um, I don't know, another thing, for example, you know, come front of an institute, kind of the MIT from Germany, say, oh, what might be kind of a monument, you know, that we have big Eiffel Towers, the London Eye. Think about a city, again, because they, what usually we do is educational, but when it's a high wind voltage, you have a lot of problem to storage in batteries and the distribution also. And this means the best things you can do when you have a lot of wind, you get an SMS in your telephone, tell you now wash your clothes, because it's cheaper, the high rate of, you know, that's the moment you have to consume energy because there is a lot of wind. And this means we're thinking like, okay, think about a mini cloud city, something when it's very windy, usually will be down, this means it's the time to wash your clothes. This means the Eiffel Tower can fly up and down, and it's a symbol for the city of reconnect yourself with something that sometimes, you know, you can just pick up the clothes and put it on the sun to dry it. It's kind of very tortuous, this addiction we have to certain re uh, relations. So I, I actually want to dive into this question myself. Um, uh, so I run a group called the Urban Metabolism Group, and what we do is account for the resources that we all consume on an annual basis. So are floating cities, cloud cities possible? Well, so all of you on average um, in this part of the world consume uh, between 25 and 30 tons per capita per year. So if we can figure out a way to put 20 to 30 tons per capita, each one of us up in the sky, then it's possible, yes. The other answer I want to give, the, other, the second part to this answer is there is a city of 8 million people in, in the sky every day. In fact, that's the average number of people who fly every day. And they're connected, you know, they're on their iPads and everything. So there, there is a city in the sky today. Right? It's, it's fossil fuel driven. It's not that vision, but it's absolutely there. So that's another, you know, that's really very much our reality. So. Other questions? Please, please go to the mic if you can. having the you know, city floating, for example, you know, 80 years ago, you know, just thinking about flying, just one person flying by itself, right? Now you can have a 380 flo floating, and you know, it's right, it's almost a city, it's a city floating there. Just have it needs an engine, but when you really make your imagination go, it's feasible to just start floating there on the early balloons, you know, but that's feasible. Now, my question here is, you know, it's a great minds here trying to do the right thing, and then you have the other side, the economy side. They say, you know what, we are the owners of the coil companies. We are the owners of the oil companies. We really don't want to fund you because we, if we fund you, we're going to be useless. How do we deal with that politics side? You know, they say, you know what, we, how we convince the people that has the funding to actually invest in the right thing to do versus, you know, I don't want to fund you because I want to keep sustaining myself. I don't care about what's happening with the rest of that. Who would like to tackle that? <laughs> <laughs> come on Friday, come, come tomorrow and day after tomorrow, we keep talking, you know what I mean. We might, we, we might get it's it. It's interesting, these panels, you know, it strikes me that this could be a day-long symposium <laughs> because there are some major themes that are just going to get not really touched on, but this is obviously one of them. I, I guess I could just say a word on it, which is that, um, you know, maybe taking it one step further, which is that uh, it's very hard for us to say we live here in a developed country that developed itself on a carbon economy, right? I mean, so we have the quality of life that we have because of fossil fuels here. Um, everything around us was built on that. And so, you know, one of the problems is, is moving forward, not just keeping things the same, but acknowledging that there's developing countries. And, and this is like saying to them, you can't develop in the same way that we did, but not at the same time offering them a replacement technology. Um, it, so I'm, I guess I'm just taking your question maybe one step further. But um, you know, I, I, I firmly believe that, that one of the things that we are going to have to do as a society is, is make the hard choices coming up. And I think it was pointed out that we've already maybe gotten to this point where we see the onset of, of severe storms, um, you know, higher temperatures, heat deaths, things like that, that at some point we're not going to be able to ignore it anymore. And because a few corporations wish to continue to make a profit um, is not going to balance out with the increasing penalties that we're all paying as, as a civilization, as a society for those things. And it's going to be a slow process. I, I, I don't think that you know, some people sort of think about turning fossil fuels off tomorrow. That's not going to happen. It's going to be a gradual decline. 
Um, some of those, uh, the, those, those power plants you were showing were being put online now, and they have lifetimes of decades. Those aren't going to be shut off. Um, the ones that are coming online today are going to be around as long as I'm going to be around. But what we can hope is that there's going to be more of the renewables, maybe some of the other alternative energy technologies coming into play, and that we slowly ramp those things down. Um, but I, I do have to bring us back to this idea that we do have to think about developing countries at the same time, handing technology off to them, and trying to see them develop not in our footsteps, not with the carbon footprint that we've had, but with a new footprint, hopefully much more renewable, hopefully much more of these alternative energies. So we have to sorry, be. I may have interrupted. Yeah. No, no, no. Um, well, I wanted to say a couple of things. One is that um, it's, I think it's a delusion to think that the laws of physics are going to be surmounted in the next uh, era. That in a uh, hundred years ago, people didn't know how to fly, and now they know how to fly. That's true. But the laws of buoyancy have been understood for a long time, <laughs> as have the laws of absorption and emission of radiation. And uh, there's no sign uh, that there's going to be a change in those laws over the lifetime that we're concerned with. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is, and I, I, I really want to say a, a word in favor of uh, the kind of art that Tomas is involved in. I think art has a political impact and can be used to agitate and change people's minds about things. And that the, uh, um, when you talk about influencing companies, uh, you, if you create a movement, if you create political agitation, if you elect people who will pass carbon tax to place a cost on the externalities of filling up the atmosphere with a toxic gas, I think you'll have the possibility of making real changes. Do, the other, which I want to add, we have to be very careful, and maybe Caroline can help me and Lila, on the idea of the we, we, we. You know, there are many people that kind of hate the term Anthropocene, because actually who produced this mess where we are living is a small percentage of the population who live on planet Earth. And then many people, they call it a capital scene. Right? This means we have to be very careful, because now suddenly it's like a we, we, we. Well, actually, there are many people who knows how to live and relate on planet Earth. And actually, the cause of the problem that then later are putting in danger the people who are suffering the consequence mm -hmm. of hyper consumption mm -hmm. are kind of is a really imbalance. And then somehow we always keep calling like we human where we put everybody in the bag. This I mean, is a part of a complicated issue over there. So we're at the end of the panel session. Thank you so much for coming, but please join me in thanking the panel. And especially Tomas and, and Joaquin and the whole team. Um, please join us um, in Lobby 10 um, for the Aerocene uh, demonstration of the, the flow predictor and um, weather permitting tomorrow and Saturday. Please join us in Killian Court for floating the aerosene. Thank you.